Now, I informed the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, six proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Seward. <clears throat> Dear Mr President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The government has no costing for its current climate policies, which have us on track for a catastrophic 3.4 degrees of warming. Is the proposal supported? It is. Thank you. I will now call Senator Waters. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the uh, matter of public importance, which is the government's climate policies, which have us on track for catastrophic global warming. And it's interesting that in December last year, when the Prime Minister was in the US at the time of the Conference of the Parties for the Climate Change Convention, he wasn't actually at that convention. He was at a box factory with uh, President Trump and a major Liberal Party donor, uh, Mr Pratt. At that same time, in New York, at the, at the Conference of the Parties on the Climate Convention, a crucial report was being handed down. The what's called United in Science report said that all countries' global pledges to date, under the Paris Agreement, have us on track for 3.4 degrees. Of global warming. And you know who was the lead author of that report? None other than the Australian Bureau of Meteorology. So this government's target, which they say they're going to meet and beat, but nobody else does, certainly no one with any qualifications, actually needs to be lifted threefold to even keep us to two degrees. And it would need to be lift, lifted fivefold to keep the damage to one and a half degrees of global heating. So we have this government's climate policy, or, or lack thereof, which has us on track for 3.4 degrees of warming. Well, what does that really mean? You think about the summer that we've just had, the fires, which burnt more than 20 per cent of our forests, which is the largest amount that's ever been burnt in our history and, in fact, is the largest amount that's ever been burnt in fires anywhere globally, the floods that followed, the dust storms that permeated, the heat waves, the hail storms, the cyclones that are forming, the drought over the summer, all of that happened with just over one degree of global warming. This government has us on track for 3.4 degrees of global warming. And I asked them the other day, do you actually understand what that means? Are you across the science of what that means? And moreover, have you actually costed what that will do to our economy? I didn't actually get an answer to that question. Uh, it's not called question time for nothing. It's certainly not called answer time. But this government, which loves to criticise everybody else uh, for their pledges to take climate action, some of which are all right, others of which are science-based, this government hasn't even costed its own climate policy. And they haven't costed the impacts on the economy of 3.4 degrees of warming. So it's a bit rich for this government to try to say that everybody else is economically reckless, because if they actually did the costings, they would realise that the true recklessness is in having the climate stance that they have, which has us on that trajectory, and in failing to do the costings of what that actually means for our economy, for our community and for our planet. Now, the climate scientists and the meteorologists have looked at this, and they say that if we're on track for 3.4 degrees, then that will mean human beings will have to migrate away from equatorial zones. High humidity will cause intolerable heat stress and flooding across most of northern Australia, rendering it uninhabitable for much of the year. The hectares of irrigated agriculture in the Murray-Darling Basin, which I thought the government was meant to care about, but you know, the policies might indicate otherwise, that will drop from 1.8 million hectares to just 100,000 hectares a $4.4 billion drop in Australian agriculture. 
One in six Australian species will be extinct or face extinction. We would have vast dead zones in our oceans. And 200 million people would sit permanently below the high tide line, affecting countries in our ge geographic region. But no, this government doesn't want to know about those impacts, certainly doesn't want to do anything about them, and it doesn't want to cost the economic impacts of that. Whenever we ask about this, the government simply says, we've got an economic plan. We're not going to damage the economy. Well, you are. Your plan stinks. It has us on track for those devastating outcomes that I've just outlined. You won't even cost your own policy, but you're happy to criticise other people for not having costed theirs. I note that the Greens have costed ours. And I note that the commentators say that taking climate action will actually be good for prosperity and will help our economy, as well as making our planet continue to be habitable. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much. Uh Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, I too rise to speak on this MPI brought before the Chamber by the Greens, and I thank them very much for the opportunity to do so. I, I genuinely do, because it gives me the opportunity to not only spruik the government's achievements in this space, which is delivering responsible and achievement, uh, achievable climate policy, but it also gives uh, all of us the opportunity to reflect on the Greens' hypocrisy. They're so focused on chasing radical policies on the off chance that they can grab a headline and keeping their base feeling warm and fuzzy that they end up achieving nothing. They're not actually here for serious discussion. They're not here for a rational debate. They're not here to represent the interests of each Australian in their own home states. We are here. We've seen uh, the, the policies, even of those opposite. Uh, they have a policy which they've announced in recent days of a net zero target by 2050 and a complete abrogation and interest and support in our 2030 targets. They don't have a 2030 target. We don't know what it is, but this government has a clear plan. And let's be clear. At the last election, uh, those opposite in Labor they, they took their uncosted policies to the election that were unachievable. But to their credit, uh, there's something, there is something that they've done. They have tested their extreme economic uh, and econ economy-destroying policies with the Australian people, but the Australian people comprehensively rejected them because Australians could see the impact it would have on their jobs, on the economy and on the cost of living. So in what should have been a period of reflection after the election where all those opposite could go away and look at what happened and develop some new, quite reasonable uh, policies, they managed to make them even more extreme. So whilst those over there dabble in the art of the unachievable, our record on the environment and emissions reduction is strong. Our Paris commitment is to reduce emissions by 26 to 28 per cent below 2005 levels by 2030, and we are well on track. On a per-person basis, this is a greater, a greater reduction than the commitments of the EU, Germany, Canada, New Zealand, even Japan. And we are on track to beat our 2020 Kyoto target by 411 million tonnes. In fact, the most recent update from Australia's National Greenhouse Gas Inventory shows that emissions are lower than in 2013 when the coalition came into government. Also, emissions are 12 per cent lower than in 2005, as opposed to a 2 per cent reduction for Canada and a 4 per cent increase for New Zealand. Emissions per person are also at their lowest levels in 29 years, falling by 40 per cent since 1990. And we are achieving this, all of this, without putting the economy at risk and putting jobs at risk, all while lowering the cost of living. So whilst on this side of the chamber we believe in having a stronger economy which creates jobs and provides more opportunities for all Australians, sadly those opposite do not. And while on this side of the chamber we believe in lowering the cost of and raising our national standard of living, those opposite do not. They don't believe in lower energy prices 
and they don't believe in tax relief, which allows businesses of all sizes to employ more people and create an, an attractive environment for investment, particularly in renewables. In fact, they believe in quite the opposite. They believe in putting policies in place which will see the Australian economy weaken, job creation evaporate and the cost of living increase exponentially and investment dry up. The government, however, is committed to ensuring a strong and robust economy, which is able to withstand the headwinds that ours is facing. This ensures we remain an attractive destination for investment and to deliver effective emissions reduction policies. In fact, our $3.5 billion climate solutions package is a great example of this. As part of this, the $2 billion climate solutions fund is supporting farmers, landholders and indigenous communities with savanna management, energy efficiency, capturing methane from landfills and storing carbon in soils. We also have the Snowy 2.0, which will increase the reliability of renewable energy. It will provide up to 175 hours of storage and meet a peak demand of up to 500,000 homes. In Tasmania, there's the Battery of the Nation and the Marinus Link. This will unlock 400 megawatts of Tasmanian hydropower to the mainland. We also have a national strategy on electric vehicles, one genuinely designed to ensure that any transition is appropriately planned and managed. It's designed for a realistic transition, not just a photo op opportunity out the front of a charging station and accused, uh, an excuse for a ride in a Tesla uh, that those opposite are all too familiar with, although, to their credit, uh, Mr Shorten's announcement in front of the Melbourne building just down the road during the election, uh, complete with power lead in hand, was, was probably one of my favourite moments of the campaign, I have to say. Uh, one could say that it was a defining moment. Uh, it was at that moment that the Australian people could see very, very clearly the lack of detail, the lack of costing and the lack of a plan. He was in the contest for an emperor, but he had no clothes. But, Mr Acting Deputy President, I digress. We also have the Environmental Program and Environment Pro uh, Restoration Fund the Clean Energy Finance Corporation and a range of other strategic investments which are making a practical impact on reducing our emissions. All of our policies are fully costed, have been endorsed by the Australian people and are creating jobs rather than slashing them. Because rather than deride our industries, we see this as a real opportunity. Right across the nation, Australian investors and entrepreneurs, captains of industry, are leading the way ensuring that Australian technology is at the global forefront on these matters. And if we live the Greens' version of this perfect world, their utopia, where all their nation-weakening policies were put in place, any chance of Australians out of work finding meaningful, well-paid and long-term employment would be gone. And if this, if this, as if this wasn't enough, under their vision, regional communities, those that are doing it the toughest, would all but cease to exist. They don't support any industry that drives our economy. We want to see the agricultural sector grow to $100 billion by 2030. They want to see much of this shut down, largely because of the cattle, uh, the cattle that emit uh, in the privacy um, of their own paddocks. Uh, these policies that they have are just outrageous. We want to encourage new investment in resource projects across the country, which drive jobs in regional centres and lift millions out of poverty right across the world. But sadly, they don't. We want to see a future-proof regional Australia through new investment in water infrastructure and resilience. I guess you can come to your own conclusions on where they sit on that. But this is the type of country they want to see Australians living in. No investment, no industry, no jobs, no regional economies and no future. And this is all for the sake of putting in place their socialist fantasies, as if what we do in this place is some type of left-wing board game. We know, we know, as we know they do too, that their vision will see economic activity shift elsewhere. Let's use mining as an example. If we were to shut down exploration, 
development and investment in new projects, are major minerals importing nations around the world going to think, wow, Australia has stopped exporting? What an important piece of symbolism. That's it. Let's shut down our own operations, our smelting facilities and power plants, and stop importing them. Of course not. They won't. The market would still be there. The exporters would be chomping at the bit to swoop in on the opportunity. What the Greens would see happen is economic growth and activity in Australia. It's not going to see the, the economic growth and activity in Australia. We're going to see those jobs move to another country, another country with a much lower standard of minerals, particularly coal, lower environmental standards and, quite likely, much less consideration for remediation after their useful life project. So what should they do? They should take a, step, a few steps back, actually have, actually have a look at what the global environment impact will be. They've got to do this. Now that would be progress. Uh, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, the contributions that we've had on this MPI uh, today show that the coalition is still, frankly, in chaos and denial when it comes to the reality of climate change and the ineffectiveness of their policies and their lack of commitment. There is no plan for jobs, no plan for wages growth and no plan from them to address climate change. The reality is, if you unpick the contribution uh, of uh, Senator O'Sullivan previously, they, this government has pocketed uh, in their climate change uh, uh, emissions reductions the policy initiatives of uh, the Rudd-Gillard governments and the action that they put in place. In addition, when you talk about emissions falling in our nation, why have they fallen? In part, emissions have fallen in the agricultural sector because of the drought, because of the effects of climate change itself. Now, I don't think our carbon accounting, frankly, has yet caught up with the emissions catastrophe uh, that takes place uh, in the context of Australia's summer and the bushfires that have been experienced and the amount of carbon uh, that has been emitted uh, in that process. And we know that it's one of the triggers that we need to look to in the acceleration of climate change globally is with increasing weather, with, uh, with uh, increasing drought, with increasing temperatures, with decreasing rainfall, is a, is a likelihood of more fires. And what is the irony of that? With more fires comes more carbon emissions. So the government needs to be very, very, very careful when it talks about uh, you know, very easily being able to claim that it's going to get to its 2030 target without putting in a real structural policy effort to work out where our nation is headed. In the Labor Party, we're committed to real action on climate change, net zero emissions by 2050. Now, we are not alone in this aspiration. So this this uh, principle is supported by business and by industry. Qantas, Santos, Telstra, BP, Shell, Chevron, Woodside, BHP, the Business Council of Australia, the National Farmers Federation, the ACTU, the Minerals Council of Australia and the Australian Petroleum Production and Exploration Association, they've all committed to net zero emissions by 2050. And we have some uh, you know, pretty large fo fossil fuel companies in there making that uh, commitment to that target. So if these companies can come out uh, in favour of net zero by 2050, well, surely this government can. Around the world, many places have a target of achieving net zero emissions by 2050. 73 countries, 14 states or regions, and 398 cities have made that commitment. Former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, who is continuing to try to drive liberal policy in lieu of any government leadership in this space, and good on him for doing so. 
someone's got to take moral responsibility uh, for this issue within the Liberal Party. Uh, former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull said, now we can see a feasible, affordable route to net zero. The alternative is catastrophic. Now, what does this government try to portray as catastrophic? What does it portray as catastrophic? It tries to portray the very notion of having this target as catastrophic, in complete denial of the need for a global commitment to address uh, emissions and bring them down. Australia can and must play its role in driving down emissions in order uh, that we um, achieve uh, a climate change target that does not see our nation in catastrophic climate change danger. If there's a more damning assessment of this government uh, than what uh, Malcolm Turnbull has said, I'd like to see it. As I said, and I quote from him, the alternative is catastrophic. Niall Blair, former deputy leader of the Nationals in New South Wales, has also had this to say. The recent announcement by federal Labor to target net zero emissions by 2050 provides a great opportunity for the agricultural sector in Australia to diversify and thrive. I've watched with interest as some suggest this policy will wipe out Australian agriculture just as they hypothesised the same for the fossil fuel industry. Nothing could be further from the truth. I see there is a huge opportunity for both farmers and brand Australia. However, we need to compare apples with apples, not apples to coal, as some are trying to do. So yesterday in this place I spoke about the red meat industry, and they have an even more ambitious target and theirs, as this place should well know by now, is net zero by 2030. Now, I find it quite ironic that this government has, in fact, used the, our target of net uh, zero by um, 2050, uh, that they've used uh, the livestock industry as an example of why um, they don't like Labor's target. So here you have the agricultural industry showing more leadership than those who purport to represent agriculture in this place. It is appalling. There is a business in Victoria, and they've already got to net zero carbon from their red meat business, so it's infinitely doable. I note that Infrastructure Australia has released their top uh, infrastructure priorities today. And you know, it's no surprise, frankly, that the list is topped by projects that mitigate the challenges that our nation faces from the result of a changing climate. We have a government here that exists in a policy vacuum on climate change. It has no plan and no leadership in this space. We know that we should um, uh, be looking to infrastructure changes uh, that can see our electricity networks strengthened so that we can diversify uh, the grid and bring in more renewable energy, uh, but instead we see this government missing in action from those kinds of commitments. We have a prime minister and a divided government of climate deniers. They've never taken action on climate change seriously, but it's amazing how quickly the Prime Minister started to change his rhetoric, uh, just as a political crisis starts to engulf him and force him to do so. There can be little real belief or policy drive uh, behind the Prime Minister when that is what, uh, it, quite transparently, you can see his language change in response not to listening to the science, not to listening to the evidence, but in response to a political, uh, an, uh, an environmental, an emergency crisis that very near resulted in him experiencing a political crisis. Instead of getting behind the business community, behind industry and committing to action on climate change, we have a government that runs out a scare campaign a scare campaign that has directly contradicted the very industries that said they want to meet this target and that they're committed to doing so. So maybe the minister should try talking up business 
instead of running these scare tactics. Because what is the real concern for business? The real concern for business is the impact of doing nothing, the impact of catastrophic climate change and the impact of being left in policy settings with a government that doesn't allow them to adapt and change for the inevitable future that they will face. Net zero emissions by 2050 is all about cleaner and cheaper energy. This will mean stronger growth for our nation, more jobs and higher wages. What we have, though, in the Prime Minister's inaction, we have in his inaction on climate change a recipe for higher power prices, fewer jobs, lower wages and slower economic growth. Senator Roberts. Mr Acting Deputy President, as a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I compliment Senator Seward for asking the government for a full costing of its climate action policies. And we ask that the Labor Party and the Greens cost their own climate policies, which call for Australia to be net zero carbon dioxide by 2050 and banning hydrocarbon energy generation, respectively. Yet the real question that we need answered is what will be the change in the global temperature if these policies are fully implemented? Where is the cost-benefit analysis? The role of this parliament, this government, its opposition and other parties is not to have a bidding war on who can outspend the other for votes or to virtue signal to the elites and the media. Our role in this place is to ensure good governance for our citizens economically, socially and environmentally. So what will occur from the government's 26 to 28 per cent renewable energy target spending billions subsidising renewable energy? What about Labor's net zero carbon dioxide in 2050? Or the Greens' plans to stop wait for this, all hydrocarbon energy power generation? I know what they won't do. Change the global temperature. It won't affect bushfires, sea level rises, cyclones, droughts, floods, ocean temperature, ocean temperature or any other natural weather event. Australia only accounts for 1.3 per cent of human global CO2 output. Cutting our output to zero cannot change the global temperature. Cannot. Even our chief scientist was courageous enough to admit this inconvenient fact in Senate estimates on the 1st of June 2017. Climate policies are already killing our competitiveness, driving our manufacturing and heavy industries into the arms of China's, China and who have no intention of limiting their carbon dioxide output. We have been suckered into giving away our strong economy because you lot are here are too gutless to stick up for Australia and protect our way of life. You have given into globalist rent seekers and the socialist United Nations who you glibly obey without a second thought on how you are hurting your own country. Shame. Shame on you all. To Australians listening to this speech, let me explain to you what reducing our carbon dioxide output to zero will re really mean to you. No livestock industry, no heavy transport, no manufacturing, no rail services, no private transport, no flying, no air conditioning or heating, and the list goes on. Who would wish for such a horrible future for our country? The Liberals, Nationals, Labor and the Greens are all following the same path. Climate policies are not about controlling climate, they're about controlling us. A nation that cannot support itself turns to government for help. Once the people are dependent on the government, they control us. One nation wants less government, not more. One nation wants to liberate Australians from government control and unleash their potential. One nation will set us free. Thank you. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, it is a pleasure to rise uh, in the chamber this evening to speak on this motion from the Greens because this government, the Morrison Coalition government, is continuing to invest in practical climate action. We have mapped out to the last tonne how we are going to meet and beat our 2030 Paris target. Our $3.5 billion climate solutions package announced in February of 2019 will deliver over 20 million tonnes of additional abatement towards our 2030 target, and technological improvements and other abatement sources will account for the remaining reductions. But, Madam, uh, rather, Mr. Acting Deputy President, every time I hear the Greens um, get up on their high horse, lecturing to the Australian people about climate, an important question springs to mind immediately. 
Why are the Greens actively campaigning against huge renewable energy projects in Tasmania if they say they take this climate change issue so seriously? A $1.6 billion renewable energy project in northwest Tasmania, the Robins Island Wind Farm, is the target of the Greens and the Bob Brown Foundation who want to stop it in its tracks. On one hand, they want to lecture the government and the Australian people about acting on climate change, but on the other hand, they're campaigning against an actual plan to add more clean energy into the grid to supplement Tasmania's reliable and emissions-free hydro energy and to create jobs and massive investment in a regional area that needs it. And why do the Greens oppose this development? Because Bob Brown said so. You'd think they would have learnt a lesson from the last election. Bob Brown thought the way to help Labor win the election and adopt green policies was to drive up to Queensland and lecture Queenslanders on how to manage their resources. And how did that pan out? But when Bob Brown says his campaign against the Robins Island wind farm will be the next Franklin Dam, the Greens swing right in behind their former leader. Personally, I suspect Tasmanian Greens would be a bit embarrassed that they have to oppose a major renewable energy development in their own state just because Bob said so. They certainly should be embarrassed, especially when you look at Mr Brown's own words about why he's campaigning against it. Mr Brown said the Robins Island plan was visually a step too far. Mariners will see this hairbrush of tall towers from 50 kilometres out to sea, and elevated land lovers will see it, like it or not, from greater distances on land. Its eye catchiness will divert from every coastal scene on the western Bass Strait coastline. Well, we'd better not create jobs and we'd better not reduce emissions in case it spoils the view, according to Bob Brown and the Greens. Won't somebody think of the mariners and the land lovers? Clearly, with the Greens, it's still a case of what Bob says goes. And so here, with this motion today and always in this chamber, they are lecturing us about climate change while the Bob Brown Foundation is out seeking donations to campaign against a renewable energy project in Tasmania. What this motion today is actually about is running a defence for the Labor Party's ridiculous non-policy announcement last week, where they chased a few headlines about a 2050 emissions reduction target. And then they immediately started complaining about how unfair it was that Australians want some detail on what that plan is and what the cost of it is. They can't even tell us what their emissions target is for 10 years' time, as the government has done, yet they want Australians to pat them on the back for making a claim that they would achieve something in 30 years' time with not the faintest detail on what they'd do, how they'd do it and what it would cost. I suppose it's not surprising that that's the level of policy development in the Labor Party when you consider the extent of their efforts currently to stand up for energy and resources jobs in Queensland and New South Wales is to just go out and have a nice dinner in Canberra and talk about it. We've heard a lot about this Otis group, but I think they're getting a bit too much credit. What have they actually done to stand up for jobs other than just have a steak and a nice bottle of red? It looks very convenient in hindsight that a supposedly pro-jobs minority in the Labor Party was stumbled across by the media just before Labor announced that their big, uncosted, unplanned attempt to win over Green voters. From where I'm standing, that looks an awful lot like the Labor Party once again trying to have a Bob H. Way. Senator Walsh. Deputy President, and thank you to Senator Seward for raising uh, this critical issue. This government's climate policies are a mess. They are an embarrassment, and they are irresponsible. And this government, while it preaches budget responsibility, cannot tell us what their current climate policies will cost. However, the man that was leading their government not too long ago, former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, has been happy to tell us what the cost is. A less habitable planet lower economic growth, lower growth in new jobs and more emissions. That is the cost of this government's plan. And this has been backed up by a CSIRO report, the Australian National Outlook 2019, which stated that if we stay on our current course, we risk, and I quote, drifting into the future, and we risk a slow economic decline. That same report mapped out a second possible future for Australia, one which it called the outlook scenario. And in this second possible future, Australia takes action on the major challenges facing it over the next few decades, 
such as emissions and climate. And in this scenario, it predicts an Australia with significantly stronger GDP growth, over double the growth in wages, and household electricity bills down 64 per cent as a proportion of household income. And all of this happens with an Australia that reaches net zero carbon emissions by 2050 with international cooperation. And I know which of these two futures that I want to see, that I want to live in, that I want to be part of. And I know the majority of Australians will agree with me. Because the cost of inaction is not just the environmental impact that a changing climate would bring, but it's also an Australia that gives up the opportunities of becoming a clean energy superpower with a new generation of jobs and cheaper bills. And I wonder which future the government would like to see. Because due to the policy decisions this government uh, has put in place, we're currently on track for the former scenario, the one which the CSIRO report named slow decline. All of the latest data confirms that this government's climate policies are hopelessly inadequate. Their own data, their own data shows that there was no reduction in emissions pollution in the quarter to September 2019. And the most recent data on annual emissions pollution shows a decline that is pathetic of just 0.3 per cent to date. So not only is Scott Morrison failing to protect Australians from the future of a changing climate, but he is also failing to take advantage of the better future that we can have that the CSIRO, the government's own uh, preeminent science agency, described in their report. Scott Morrison and his government are the only ones who don't seem to think that we should cut emissions pollution and invest significantly in renewables to get to zero net emissions in 2050. Uh, this, argument, this argument is only happening inside the Liberal and National parties, because everyone else agrees, and they have done for a long time. So what we need to be able to move forward to a better future is for this government and the two parties that make it up to resolve their internal conflicts. That is what we need. We need them to resolve their internal disputes and to make a plan now, because we can't wait any longer. Uh, and though uh, I have to say that it's becoming increasingly clear that plans aren't really the style of this government. We, on the other hand, see a positive future where Australia is a clean energy superpower with a new generation of jobs and cheaper energy bills, a future which sees a positive and forward-looking Australia, an Australia which moves forward with the rest of the world because there is now a real consensus on what needs to happen, with 73 countries around the world, every Australian state and territory and major business groups supporting zero net emissions. There are major, major countries, the Business Council, the AIG, the Property Council and some of our biggest employers, and they all see the same positive future that Labor sees. And what we really need to do is to deliver certainty about the future, and that is what a zero net emissions target does. It delivers certainty, and certainty is what this government refuses to provide. Business needs it to invest. And young people need it to know that our generation will deliver them a healthy planet. We owe that to them. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. It's absolutely beyond doubt that climate change is costing us big time. The catastrophic fires we've seen this summer, uh, the devastation to communities, uh, to local businesses, uh, to the ecosystems, the disruption. Uh, to our uh, gross national product. It's all there for anyone who uh, has eyes wide open, Acting Deputy President. Um, and while I acknowledge uh, that these are environmental problems, uh, climate change is an environmental problem, it does surprise people when I tell, when I tell them that actually, uh, yes, of course, climate change is an environmental problem, but First and foremost, it's an economic problem. Anyone who has a basic understanding of economics and business and finance knows about externalities that are created from business activities. And climate change 
CO2 pollution, other forms of greenhouse gas emissions are an externality, an economic cost. And, uh, it, it never ceases to amaze me that those on the other side who claim to be champions of markets don't understand that if they actually applied basic economic principles, they would understand that you need to use those tools to tackle climate change and therefore price the cost, price the externality to our economy and efficiently deal with it. And because it's an economic problem, Acting Deputy President, and I'd actually put to you that nearly every environmental problem I could name, and many social problems, are first and foremost economic problems. And because these all come from business activities, they are also ultimately a political problem. Because you can't fix a broken system without doing that through parliament and through politics. And this is where it gets really interesting with this mob on the other side. They are in the pockets of special interests. They always have been, especially the fossil fuel industry, and they refuse to act. They tore up the world's best package on tackling greenhouse gases and CO2 purely for cynical political reasons and to support their big backers in the fossil fuel and the mining industry. And now we have absolutely nothing, zero policy to cost. And Australians are waking up to the fact there are costs of inaction. We heard ad nauseum from Mr Tony Abbott about the uh, you know, axe the tax and the costs of climate change. But we've never had an acknowledgement at all from the other side, from so-called people, conservatives, who understand economics and finance, that there are costs of inaction. Go speak to the insurance companies if you want to understand what the costs of inaction are. Go speak to local governments. Go speak to the fireys. Go speak to the communities who are facing increased extreme weather events, droughts, floods, cyclones bushfires, and it is only going to get worse, Acting Deputy President. The best available science tells us if we don't act on climate now, it is going to get worse and it is going to cost us billions of dollars more. The estimates I've heard so far from these bushfires, and we'll get into this next week at Senate Estimates with Treasury, is at least $100 billion cost to our economy. That's one event. That is one event. So if you want to have an honest debate, Yes, there will be costs of transitioning our economy to a clean energy future. Yes, there will be costs, but those costs are by far outweighed by the cost of inaction. By far outweighed. And there are opportunities for transitioning out of coal, out of other fossil fuels, towards renewable energy, 100 per cent renewable energy. And I'm proud that my party has been the party of renewable energy. We are the party that negotiated $10 billion for wind farms, $10 billion to invest in ARENA and in the CEFC to supercharge and drive this transition. And we will be the party that will be introducing a Green New Deal that Australians will vote for, that is jobs rich and actually solves the problem, solves the externality, tackles the economic problem and tackles the political problem, because we are the only party with a Thank you, with Senator Wish-Wilson. Your time has expired. Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, uh, I think uh, the, the, the introduction of this, uh, this motion from the Australian Greens is a classic example of hoisting yourself on your own petard, uh, because it's the Australian Greens coming to this chamber uh, criticising other uh, political parties for not doing adequate costings. This is a party that regularly proposes policies which are uncosted, uh, which have no basis in uh, what they would cost, uh, and, uh, and are now claiming and, cr and, and criticising others for the same. Uh, some might not remember it wasn't that long ago that the former Treasury Secretary, Mr Ken Henry, made the very apt claim that there wasn't a computer large enough to cost the Greens' policies. <laughs> they were that radical, they were that out there, 
that there was not the processing power available in the world, according to former Mr Ken Henry, to cost the Australian Greens policies. Now, there has been advancements in microchips and processes since then. Perhaps, perhaps we have got to the level where we can uh, run a, uh, an economic model to cost the Greens policies, but I'm a bit sceptical. I'm a bit sceptical. No evidence has been presented in this debate from the Australian Greens that that is possible just yet. Just yet. Now, in terms of the costs of, of, of our climate change policies, uh, they were modelled. We did produce economic modelling last year about the cost of reach meeting a 26 to 28 per cent target. In fact, we also we actually produced modelling back before the Paris Agreement was signed. I remember Mr Greg Hunt, I think he commissioned modelling from Warwick McKibben's uh, economic modelling outfit, which uh, outlined the costs of uh, the, the commitments we were taking to the Paris negotiations at that time. But then they, we, we did update those last year ahead of the election. We were upfront with the Australian people that there would be a cost associated with reducing our carbon emissions uh, to our commitment of 26 to 28 per cent reduction by 2030. We've been upfront about that, but there is a cost. There is a cost. The people that are not being upfront in this debate are those that are trying to claim that there would be no cost uh, from reducing carbon emissions in the Australian economy. That is a fairy tale that the Australian people understand well. The Australian people have a very good radar for when they're being sold a pup, especially a pup uh, by politicians who have a tendency to gild the lily on their own policies. Uh, the, the, the idea that's been presented by the Australian Labor Party over the last week that somehow uh, we could get to net zero emissions in just 30 years' time and there won't be a coal miner lose their job, uh, there won't be increased uh, costs on the Australian people, there won't be a hit to our productivity and our economic growth and our wealth. That is an absolute fantasy and the Australian people know it. The absurdity, the absurdity of the leader of the Labor Party in this place, Senator Wong, saying the other week that oh, it doesn't matter what the costs are because the costs of inaction are 20 times higher. There was no basis for that 20 times. There was no calculations, no proper analysis. It was a figure literally pulled out of the backside. Pulled out of the backside. Now, now Mr. Mr. Acting Deputy President, fortunately for us, there has been some attempt, some attempt to cost these types of policies around the world. New Zealand have adopted a net zero emissions target, and while I don't support this policy. I at least give New Zealand credit, the New Zealand government credit, for com actually commissioning economic modelling into, into that, that target. That economic modelling makes pretty sobering, sobering reading. Their own modelling, commissioned by the New Zealand government, showed that a net zero emission target in New Zealand would have halved the dairy sector, uh, would have reduced their, their, uh, economic, their economy, sorry, their GDP, by 21 per cent. It would put, it put wages down by up to 28 per cent. This is hundreds of billions of dollars of cost if it applied to the Australian economy, and our economy, of course, is more carbon intense than that in New Zealand. Now, because of those costs, because of those costs in New Zealand, the New Zealand government ultimately exempted agriculture from their net zero target. Agriculture is 48 per cent of New Zealand's emissions, and they have just completely exempted it because of those costs. Meanwhile, the Australian Labor Party, with no costings, no analysis, have said that they have, have left open the question that agriculture would be included, that our nation's farmers would be in the gun from a policy that even the New Zealand government has not adopted. But the Australian Labor Party here, without any analysis, without any numbers, are seeking to put a massive new tax, a massive new constraint on agricultural development in this country. And I'll finish on this point. The, the Australian Labor Party is running around quoting the CSIRO report that's been recently done saying we can achieve net zero emissions. They obviously haven't read the 400, 400 plus page technical report to that report because in that report it says that agricultural production would be in substantial decline under a net zero emissions policy. That is a policy the Australian Labor Party have signed up to to decline our agricultural production, to hit our farmers and make sure our economy is weaker in the future. Senator Ayers. Well, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, if uh, any ordinary Australian had the misfortune of tuning into Senate radio over the course of the last 10 minutes, they will have seen the worst of Australian politics. Uh, it's contemptible, really, what the Australian public's been served up by the Greens political party and the National Party in terms of the future of the country's approach. Uh, if, we are serious, if we are serious about dealing with emissions, you wouldn't go anywhere near this lot and this bloke, you, you, are, you are as bad as each other, both, both completely internally focused, both unable to deal with the theory of change in a policy or a political pathway to reduce emissions, 
to increase jobs, to lower costs. You are incapable of doing it. You always have been. You won't get any better. And Australians will see through. Australians will see through uh, the internally focused, rabid politics of the National Party and the Greens political party over the course of the next couple of years. Senator Canavan is only capable of negative slogans and weird claims. He deliberately and dishonestly conflates cost to the budget and cost to the economy. Even his friends, his former friends in the National Farmers Federation, disavow his rabid and weird approach uh, to this set of issues. If we are honest about this debate, then we must be serious about the costs of inaction on climate change. What are the costs going to be if global temperatures rise by one degree, two degrees, three degrees, more than three degrees? I mean, we'd take you a lot seriously if you had a pathway to fix it, but what is the cost going to be to the economy? Well, we know, we know that the cost to the economy of the drought, 0.2 per cent of GDP in one quarter, one quarter, thousands of homes gone, lives lost. The drought, the economies that Senator Canavan pre pre pretends to care about. Let's look at employment, about what's happened in the drought. Just one sector, people employed in sheep, beef and grain, rural labourers, the kind of people that he drivels on about in the, in the uh, Weatherboard and Iron podcast that I urge you to ignore. Well, that great sort of that, that I, I'm, look, I'm the sole listener. Nobody else listens. It's just me. It's just me. I'll start posting about it soon. ABARES, that organisation that's well known for being a radical outfit, says that employment in that sector has halved over the course of the period between 2000 and now. These are the people he, pre he pretends to care about. The Commonwealth Bank says that half a per cent to three quarters of a per cent of GDP gone. Those costs felt disproportionately in rural communities. It is absolutely incumbent upon this government to take account, to be public about measures of cost in terms of global emissions rising. Now, in all this shiftiness, conflating the cost of the budget and the cost of the economy, uh, the shiftiness, the dishonesty, what is clear is that both in terms of cost to the budget and cost to the economy, the costs of action are dwarfed by the costs of inaction. When there is no debate that those opposite won't debauch and debase or use to diminish our democracy, there is no pathway to stopping global warming by supporting the Greens political party. There is no pathway to stopping global warming by supporting the National Party or the Liberal Party. We have to reduce Australia's emissions, manage new opportunities for the regions, for clean energy, industrial diversification and take a credible position to global climate change negotiations. If you, if you, if you were interested in this, you'd read what Niall Blair, the former Nationals deputy leader in New South Wales, had to say. And he said a net zero emissions future in Australia provides nothing but opportunities for our farmers. And with 30 years to get there, they are ready, willing and able. It's also the right thing to do, he said. If you're interested in energy prices going down, if you're interested in increasing good jobs, if you're interested in more jobs and more investment in the aluminium and steel sectors, if you're in interested in reducing emissions, you will be voting Labor and supporting the Thank Labor you, approach. Senator, is, uh, Senator McKim. Okay. Well, thank you, Acting Deputy President. If I was listening to this debate, as I'm sure um, some Australians are, uh, if I'd heard the, uh, the last two uh, contributions from Senator Canavan and Senator Ayres, who's now um, fleeing the chamber rather than listen um, to my speech, I, I don't know whether I'd be tearing my hair out or, or vomiting in the, um, the passenger floor of the car that I was driving. Seriously, 
Um, we, we have just seen some Senator of the biggest Brockman. straw man arguments ever erected. Uh, Senator McKim, if you could be seated for a moment. Senator Brockman on a point of order. It's a, uh, a convention in this place, uh, Mr Acting uh, Deputy Chair, that we do not reflect when our colleagues, are, whether they're in or the chamber or not, or whether they are leaving the chamber. I would ask you to bring that to the attention of Senator McKim. Uh, Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Chair. As I was saying, um, we have seen some of the biggest straw man arguments that uh, I've seen in my time in politics uh, erected um, this evening by Senator Canavan and uh, Senator Ayres. And I'm not going to waste um, the, the very short time I have in, uh, to make this speech in demolishing every single straw man that, uh, that they've put up. Um, but I will say to um, Senator Ayres, the Greens have a fully costed set of policies that clearly lay out a pathway to drive Australia's emissions down in line with what the climate science is telling us, which is that we need to reduce our emissions starting now, not uh, in, at some uh, indeterminate time in the future, as proposed by the Labor Party. And in terms of what Senator Canavan um, said, all of our—he said we didn't cost our policies. Every single policy that we took to the last election was costed by the independent, rigorous process of the parliamentary budget office, and he shouldn't mislead Australians about, uh, in fact, what we put before them at the last election. And we will again have a rigorous, rigorously costed policy framework as we um, approach the next election. And our policies will be in line with what the climate science is telling us, because. With a 2050 target, Labor is walking away from Australia's Paris commitment, and they've got us on a pathway under Labor's policy for three degrees of global warming. And of course, the reason they're doing it is they're run by the coal huggers over there in the Labor Party. And Senator Ayres is what a classic example of the kind of coal hugger that is standing in the way of strong climate action uh, within the Labor Party, whereas the Liberal Party, of course, um, you wouldn't think it possible, have an even worse set of climate policies than the Labor Party because they've been bought out by their corporate mates in the fossil fuel sector. One thing we can categorically state in regards to the costs of reducing emissions is that the longer we leave it, the more expensive it will get. The other thing that we can categorically state about the costs of reducing emissions is that the cost of not acting to reduce our emissions will be far, far greater than the costs of acting. The science is abundantly clear. We need to take strong action to reduce our emissions now. But the whole framing of this debate, which has been driven by many in the media, News Corp, many other media outlets, including disappointingly some in the ABC, the framing of this debate is most unhelpful and not an honest framing, because there are significant opportunities available for this country in becoming a global leader in responding to climate change. They include in renewable energy generation. They include in the hydrogen economy, which, by the way, will only stack up in emissions terms if the hydrogen is created by uh, using renewable energy rather than fossil fuel energy. There are major job opportunities available, and the Greens have laid out those opportunities, and we will lay them out in our Green New Deal, a historic program for significant public investment into the transition so we can look after people in affected communities. And I'm not talking about turning coal miners into baristas here. We are talking about genuine opportunities in manufacturing, in energy generation, in rewilding and reforesting, which is what the science is telling us we need to do to take action to um, meet Paris targets and to drive global emissions down. This whole debate is a furphy regardless, because history will show you that even the Treasury Department can't get their budget forecast right even for six months into the future. And yet this government comes up and expects people to cost things over the coming decades. It's a crock, 
this debate and what we should be focusing on is taking advantage of the opportunities, making sure we support our people through the inevitable transition because it's going to come whether we like it or not. The sooner we get with the program, the more opportunities there will be for the transition and the fewer costs there will be to our community. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. We are in a climate emergency and the government is sitting on their hands. Hands which are stained with the dirty donations from the fossil fuel lobby. The Liberals' lack of action has us fully on track for 3.4 degrees of warming, which will have catastrophic consequences. And history will remember you as the cowards who did nothing in a climate emergency. History will remember you as villains who blocked international action on climate. And history will remember you as the dishonest government who knew the signs and chose not to act to save the planet. School kids have shown incredible courage by marching in the tens of thousands to demand action. It's because they want a fighting chance for a future where not every summer is marked by severe bushfires, where they can breathe without masks, where they can enjoy nature. There are no two ways about this. Scientists have this week warned that both liberal and labor policies fall dangerously short of the action that we actually need. Labor's target of zero net emissions by 2050 puts us on track to blow the Paris budget. We need to front end our emissions reductions. Labor haven't outlined any plans to cut pollution. We need action now. Scientists tell us that we, if we are to keep our planet habitable, there should be no new fossil fuel developments for domestic use or for export. Quitting coal, oil and gas is the real test on which Labour and Liberals have failed time and again and they have failed miserably. Our actions in the next few years will define what the world looks like in the next 50 years. The absolute lack of any leadership from the Liberals and Labour will not save us in this climate emergency. I shall now uh, proceed to the consideration of documents. The documents are listed on page four.